OCW load development this week on Mail Call Mondays. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. This week on Mail Call Mondays, we are going to talk about OCW, or Optimal Charge Weight Load Development. Now, there are a ton of different ways to develop the optimal load for your precision rifle. OCW is just one of those, but it has some merits, and it has some places that it fits in a little bit better than other load developments. Usually when I'm developing a load for a precision rifle, I'll run a ladder test at 200 or 300 yards. And a ladder test is simply where you determine the window of charge weights that you want to test. Usually you're going up by 0.2 or 0.5 grain increments. And then you will load a segment of cartridges, either one or two cartridges for each one of those steps. And you'll fire them at a 300 yard target and you're not going to compensate for elevation you're not trying to get a good group you're just trying to fire them all using the same scope settings and same point of aim and that will string those shots vertically then you can go look and see where cartridges start to group together where charge weights start to group together and you'll select a charge weight in the middle of that group which will give you a fairly temperature resistant and pressure resistant load now that's great, but what if you don't have a 300 yard range? The other problem with ladder testing is you have to have some way to differentiate each one of those single shot holes, which means either you're going to put a camera down range, which is what I will generally do, but you can only do that if you're the only shooter on the range or you trust all the other shooters, otherwise you end up with a very expensive target blown up all over the range. Um, the other option is you fire a shot or a group of shots, go down range, mark them, come back, fire again, and this I've done once before and it took me an entire day to fire a shot string for load development because it's fine if you have a range that you're the only one that's shooting on it. If you're shooting on your own property you can go down and mark it, but if you have to wait for other shooters to go cold before you can go down and mark your shot holes, it takes forever. Ever. Plus, you have to remember you're going 300 yards down range and 300 yards back every single time. If you're not driving your vehicle down and back, then that's going to elevate your heart rate. It's going to make you have to concentrate more on the fundamentals of marksmanship to get your precise shots. Depending upon your physical condition, that may not be an option. So now we come to OCW load development. Well, OCW, the way I do it is loosely based off of a paper or research done by Dan Newberry, and I will leave a link to his page down in the description below so you can go get it right from the horse's mouth. But basically what the Newberry OCW load development is, is you will select your powder and bullet that you're going to use for the test. You'll then look up what the maximum charge weight for that combination is. In the case of what we did for this load workup for the Mega Arms Ma 10, we selected a Sierra 175 grain Bowtail Hollow Point. It's the Sierra Match King, which is a very, very accurate bullet and it works great in a very wide array of rifles. It's well suited to a 1 in 12 to 1 in 10 twist barrel, so if you're anywhere in there, you should be good to go. Uh, we also uh, selected Varget Powder for this load. Varget is a fairly temperature stable powder and right now it's really difficult to get Reloader 15 which is what I usually use so we have switched over to Varget which required that we work up some new loads. Now if we go to Hodgson's website uh, you'll notice that they have a reloading data center on there and again I'll leave a link in the description below. You can plug in what you're using in their website and they will tell you what the minimum and maximum charge weights are and minimum estimated velocity and maximum estimated velocity for those charge weights. Now the velocity, you can kind of just throw that out. The only thing I ever use those velocity numbers for is to get an idea if I'm going to be able to get a working velocity range that is for what I want. And we'll talk about velocity more here in just a minute. Now the website, Hodgson's website states that for Varget and a 175 Sierra Match King, 45 grains of powder is my maximum charge. Now, word on maximum charges. 
the lawyers write these maximum charges. They put these maximum charges in there so that there's a wide, wide safety range. Maximum charge stated in a reloading manual may or may not be the maximum charge for your rifle, your chamber, and your environmental conditions. So you need to understand what you're doing should you choose to exceed the maximum charge weight. I'm not gonna advocate that you exceed the maximum charge weight. I'm saying that if you choose to do so, educate yourself and understand why you're doing that, not just to get better performance. Make sure you know what the possible outcomes could be. You do not want to blow your gun up. It just really is not a good situation to be in. So now that we know what our stated max is, in order to start the OCW load development, we are going to drop below the stated maximum charge by 10%. Uh, this is usually very safe to do because in modern firearms, don't do this if you're using an antique firearm, it's very safe to do in modern firearms because the maximum charge weight has a great safety area built into it. Most rifles can still fire maximum charge weights in book stated maximum charges. So we're going to back down 10% to give ourselves a big area of safety. We're going to load the first cartridge at 10% below maximum. So in this instance, it would be 4.5 grains less than the 45 grain total. So you're looking at 40.5 grains to start out with. You're then going to come up 2% and load another cartridge. You're then going to come up 2% again and load another cartridge. This gives you three cartridges. What we're going to use these three cartridges for, and you can't see because it's below down here, we'll use those three cartridges to zero the rifle for this load development and to check for pressure signs. Every cartridge that comes out of the chamber of the rifle, we're gonna check that cartridge for pressure signs. We're gonna make sure that we're not getting any primer flow, we're not getting flat primers, we're not getting any ejector swipes on it, um, those kind of things. We're not getting any bulging case heads. So you're gonna inspect carefully every cartridge that we fire for a load development. Now once we have those three cartridges, we're just gonna fire those for a three shot group. We're gonna get our zero based upon them, go for the center of the shot group because they'll be a little bit strung, more than likely. So zero up for the center, or sometimes I know we're going up from there. So I'll zero up for the top of that shot group. That way I know that almost all of our charges from that point are gonna hit at a higher elevation on the target. So if you zero for the top of that shot group, then you're gonna be good to go. Now the next cartridge that we load, we're going to come up another either 0.7% or 1%. Uh, in the case of the load development that we're doing here, I came up two-tenths of a grain. Uh, and my increment for everything that we went through was two-tenths of a grain. Two-tenths of a grain gives you pretty fine resolution. Uh, my scale and my reloading stuff really is not accurate enough to try to do a one-tenth of a grain workup. It's just not going to give me a lot of data. Two-tenths, I think, is, we're going to be pretty well good to go. Um, for this test, we started at 43 grains of Vargit, and the reason I started at 43 instead of the 40.5 is because I really don't care if we hit an accuracy node at a really, really low velocity, 2400 foot per second or something like that. This is a long range precision rifle, so I need velocity to be able to get the bullet out there and still cheat the wind. If we're going transonic at 600 yards, it's not going to help me anything. So. I like to focus on the higher window, plus I know that 43 grains of Varget is a safe load in just about every rifle that I have here, so I can start at 43 grains and be safe. So we started our first section of cartridges and we loaded 43, 43.5, 44, and 44.5, I take that back. We loaded at 43, 43.5, and 40. Those were our first three cartridges. And those we used to zero, and we drove on from there. Uh, our next charge weight, we loaded with 44.2, and we loaded four cartridges with 44.2. Then came up to 44.4, loaded four cartridge, or three cartridges with 44.4, etc. And we kept going up two tenths of a grain. Now, the stated 
OCW load development, you're supposed to go up until you are one step above maximum charge weight, and that's where you're supposed to stop. And again, this is a safety thing. So if you don't know what you're doing, then follow the directions, don't go above maximum. I wanted to push the limits a little bit, but I know how to read my cartridges and look for pressure signs, and semi-automatic rifles I find show pressure signs very, very evidently. You'll start to get stuff like poor extraction, you'll start to get all kinds of nasty marks on the case head, you'll start to bend uh, case rims when it's trying to extract with too much pressure, all that stuff. So there are a lot of pressure signs that you'll see with semi-automatic rifles. I went ahead and ran our work up until we got to 46 grains, which is a full grain over stated max. Even at 46 grains, we didn't see any pressure signs, but again, we'll get into that here in just a second about reading our cartridges. Now to keep some form of organization as we're loading these, what I like to do is I take a black sharpie and I will actually write the charge weight on the side of the case. This doesn't damage your cases any at all, it tumbles off. It may take a couple of times going through the tumbler before they're totally gone, but the first time you run them through the tumbler, most of it's gone and all you'll see is a little bit of a ghost image of the sharpie on there. But this makes it really easy for me if for some reason I drop my ammo box when we're on our way out to the range and things scatter everywhere. I'm not totally lost. I can pick these up, throw them back into the case, and I know what charge weight is what. I used to put the cases in Ziploc bags with a little piece of paper that said what the charge weight is, but it is really a massive pain in the butt. And when you get to the range and you're trying to sort through all this stuff, it's just irritating. So I'll take a plastic reloading box I actually use the Frankfurt Arsenal reloading boxes. They're fairly cheap, couple bucks a piece, and they work great for this stuff. I will write my charge weight on the case, and I will drop it in the box. And I have three rows for this, since we're 10 cases, or 10 different uh, shot groups. Each charge weight had three cases in it, so it was perfect for me just to do three rows of 10, and each vertical row was the same charge weight. Uh, made it really easy to go through and get those organized. Once we have our cartridges loaded through our entire uh, charge weight window that we're gonna test, we're gonna go out to the range and we're gonna set a target board in at 100 yards. This is one of the reasons that OCW charge development is good to go versus ladder tests. Ladder tests to really get separation and to see what you need to see, you need to get some pretty good range going. Uh, if you try to do a ladder test at 100 yards, you're more than likely just gonna blow a big ragged hole through the center of the target and it's not gonna tell you anything. So if you're limited to a 100 yard range for your load workup, OCW is a good way to go. When we set our target board out, we are gonna have a single target for each of the different charge weights. And in this case, I'm just using the uh, target spots. They're really easy to stick on a cardboard backer. They work great, give you a really fine aiming point to aim at. Um, so we have 10 target spots set out here, and I just put a little marker dot for my zero. Um, didn't need to get any fancy on that. The first thing you're gonna do after you fired your three zeroing test cartridges. If you have no pressure signs, you're going to go on to your first charge weight. You're going to fire your first charge weight at charge number one. You're only going to shoot one cartridge. Take that cartridge out, inspect it, make sure you don't have any bulges in the case, make sure that you don't have any cratering in your primer, that your primer is not, the spot where the firing pin hit it is not poking out of the back of the primer. Make sure you don't have a hole in your primer, make sure it didn't punch it with the firing pin, that's also a pressure sign. Uh, make sure that you don't have any marks where the case head is flowing into the ejector recess. If you get a little tit poking up on the side of your case, that's a pressure sign. Now if you just get a little curl of brass, some ARs have a sharp ejector recess and just the impact of that case hitting against the bolt can shave off a little coil of brass. So if it's just a little shaving of brass, don't worry about it, but if you can run your fingernail across it and you feel that circle sticking up, that's a pressure sign, be aware of it. If you look at the rim of your case and you have a section where the rim is bent back, 
that's a pressure sign because it means the bolt is trying to rip that cartridge out and it's still stuck in your case. So heed those signs. If you have any swelling back here at the case head, you want to pay attention to that. Now you may get just a little bit that you can feel with your thumb. Depending upon how your chamber's cut and how well your bolt fits, you may get a little. But if it's anything drastic, stop, you know, figure out what's going on and then go on after that or stop. That's your maximum charge weight and discard any cases beyond that. Now we're going to fire one cartridge at each one of these dots. One cartridge from each charge weight at each one of the targets. After firing each one, you'll inspect it before you go on to the next one. Once we get all the way through, once we get all the way through, if we've gotten to our maximum charge weight, then we're going to go back and we're going to start at our maximum charge and we're going to shoot our second shot in each group going down. The reason that we're doing this is your first shot the bore in the chamber in your rifle is going to be relatively cool. It'll, it'll have warmed up when you fired your zero rounds, so it will be above environmental temperature, but it's not going to be blazing hot. Even with a semi-automatic system, when you get down to this one, even if you've been waiting three, four, five minutes between each shot, your chamber and barrel is going to be fairly hot. It's not going to be smoking hot. You don't want to do this you don't want to load a magazine and just scream rounds down range. You want to give some time because we're trying to keep the barrel at an intermediate temperature. But still, you're going to have a hot barrel when you get to 46. And that's why we go low to high, checking for pressure as we go up. Now, once you get there, whatever charge weight you decide to stop at, either due to pressure signs or due to your maximum charge that you've loaded, you're then going to fire on that and go back. This way you're going down. And again, when you get back up here, the barrel's gonna be hotter here than it was down here. So you're evening things out. We'll then start again with number one, and we'll fire our third shot through the groups going up. And all it is is it's trying to even things out. It's trying to keep an even keel when you go through the whole test. Now, once we've got done shooting all of those, we're gonna come out here and we're gonna look at what our shot groups look like. We don't really care about how tight the shot group is for an OCW load test. What we care for is where the shot group lands. So you want to find the center of each one of these shot groups and you're going to compare as we go along. And what you will notice is the center point on these shot groups will move as you go up through the charge weights. Now your rifle may move differently than this one. This one we just had a little bit of travel from the center to the high right and that was pretty much what it was doing through the entire test. It didn't have a drastic amount of movement. If you're working with a sporter rifle with a lighter weight barrel then you may have a whole lot more movement. This isn't a super heavyweight barrel on this rifle but it's lighter than what you'll find on most, or it's heavier than what you'll find on most hunting rifles. So now we go through here and we'll see a pattern. We'll see the groups actually move as we go up. And as we're looking on this target, you can see we started here, center of our shot group's over here, center of our shot group is over here, over here, and then it started to come kind of back to the center for this one. So. These two are almost the same. Here they started to move up. And what it looks like to me is this is the start of a node. Here's where we're the most accurate in the node. And then here's the end of the node. A lot of what you're doing when you look at these is you're trying to see pictures in the clouds. So it's your best interpretation of it. I've done accuracy tests like this before, or low workup before, where I'll see something and somebody else will see something different. Uh, there is a lot of art to load development and a little bit of science. So when we look at these, if I was going to go off this first node, I would probably come in here and say either our third or fourth group is a good place to investigate 
on this workup. Now as we come down here into the higher shot groups we'll have the same thing. These two are about the same. This one's starting to climb and this is climb as well. So we have another node starting to form here but I didn't go high enough to see where that node ends. Now because we've got a couple here that are grouping in the same spot you can take the middle. So somewhere between 44.8 and 44.4. 44.6 might be a good one but you really wouldn't be wrong to go with any of these three. I prefer to go in the middle because this way if I screw up and I throw two tenths low or two tenths high I'm still in the accuracy node and the shots are going to group together. Now once we've selected a shot group or a charge weight that works for us we're going to load up a cartridge at that shot group. So if we chose 44.6 then we are going to load a cartridge at 44.6 we're then going to load a cartridge at 44.4 and we're going to load a cartridge at 44.8 we're going to take those out and get a little bit more range I would say shoot at 200, 300 yards, 400 yards if you have it and shoot those three cartridges and then you're going to go down and you take a look at your shot grouping and really you should have a sub MOA shot group if the rifle's capable of some sub MOA. The shot group from those three cartridges that you fire should be very close to the accuracy that the weapon system is capable of. If it is, that's how you verify the group and you know that that workup is good, that that charge weight is valid. Because now you know that if you're running 44.6, even if there's a little bit fluctuation to one side or the other on the charge weight that you're throwing, or if there's a little bit fluctuation one side or the other on the pressure in the cartridge for whatever reason, then you're going to still group together. Now that is the way that you're supposed to do it by the Dan Newberry instructions. Now because I can go out and I can have a bad day and I can introduce a little bit of error into my test or maybe the rifle isn't performing as well as it should and it may throw a little bit larger shot groups than I was hoping for. I like to have all the information I can have. Now what I like to do is I like to look at what the optimal barrel time for this barrel is and then I try to look through my load data and find which charge weight is going to give me that optimal barrel time. Now what optimal barrel time is is nothing more than the shock wave from detonating that cartridge traveling through steel. Shock waves travel through steel at a consistent speed and what will actually happen is when you fire this barrel will act like a tuning fork. That shock wave will race down the barrel from the chamber to the muzzle. When it reaches the muzzle it can't go anywhere and it reverberates back to the chamber and it will bounce back and forth between the barrel and the chamber. When this happens as the shock wave runs down, your barrel or your muzzle will expand and contract, expand and contract. So what optimal barrel time tries to do is it tries to match up the bullet reaching the muzzle when that shock wave is as far away from the muzzle as possible because the shock wave causes the barrel to open. So we want the shock wave as far away as we can so that the muzzle is as tight as it can get. Now what we can do is go to an optimal barrel time chart like the one I have here and I'll leave a link down below for where you can locate that thing um, and I come down here and I see 16 inch barrel where there are nodes because again that shock waves reverberating back and forth. Our first node starts at 0.5527 and that's milliseconds. Um, there's no way I can load a cartridge in this rifle that will get that bullet to the muzzle in that amount of time. I blow the gun to pieces. So what we'll do is we come down here and we try to find a optimal barrel time node that matches up with one of our charges in here. This is where it gets a little tricky and for this I use quick load and I will print out a sheet, a load table from quick load and when I come down to the load table one of the columns on the load table is barrel time 
and I can look down through the barrel time in the load table and I can match that with the barrel time nodes in the optimal charge weight or the optimal barrel time table. And what I come up with here is that just judging by the table and just judging by the optimal barrel time sheet, 45.2 grains will give me 0.882 milliseconds of barrel time. And optimal barrel time for node 6 on this table is 0.8821. So those match up as closely as I can get it, and that's 45.2, but there's a catch. There is some error in the quick load table because the quick load table can't take into account the chamber that is in this rifle. We actually have to fire cases first. We have to measure the water weight capacity of them and the type of brass and all this nonsense to be able to tweak this table to be able to match exactly. Since it doesn't match exactly, then we have to try to match up by a different um, factor. And what I like to do is I have a chronograph set up downrange to tell me what my muzzle velocity is. Well, I can come back on my load table here and I can look up and I can see this 0.882 barrel time coincides with a muzzle velocity of 24.99. I can then go back down through my chronograph numbers for that test and I can see which one of these shot groups matches up with my velocity on my load table for that barrel time. And when I do that, then I can look and see if that coincides with an accuracy node for our workup. Now if it does, regardless of what else I try to pick, I'm probably going to load up some test charges for that node as well. Uh, that way we've got two things to test out and we'll go back out to the range and test those again. Now there are a ton of other things that you can do, a ton of other things that you can check when you get into this. You can start playing with seating depth, you can try turning necks, you can try doing all kinds of crazy stuff. I just really don't have time to do that. I want to get the most accurate load that I can conveniently load up for the rifle and go. The goal with this load, or this load workup, for this rifle was to try to gain a little bit of velocity back from this 16 inch barrel to try to make it a more effective long range rifle as well as a good intermediate range rifle. Right now it's a great intermediate range rifle. Um, I would have absolutely no problems taking this rifle for any task that is out to 600, 700 yards. When it goes 800 and beyond, that's when the 16 inch barrel will start to get sketchy. So that's something you need to keep in mind what your goals are. Are you trying to come up with a great hunting cartridge or are you trying to come up with a great match cartridge? Are you shooting close range matches or long range matches? If I'm shooting close range stuff, then I'm not going to mess with the super high velocity stuff. I want to find where my most accurate node is going to be and I don't care what the velocity is because we're not going to run transonic if we're shooting under 600 yards. Now, you can finish this out, take a couple of charge weights, and just go shoot some groups and see which one gives you the tightest group. But again, what we're looking for in an optimal charge weight workup is we're looking for a change resistant load, a load that is going to be accurate over a wide range of factors. So you want to pick one in the middle of the accuracy node, even if maybe it doesn't coincide with exactly what you wanted. In this case, it looks like I'm probably going to be a little bit more accurate at a lower velocity than I wanted to get. I was hoping to get pretty close to 2600 foot per second. If I do that, I'm running up here on the top end of my charge weight and really because of what I found on this test, if I want to do that, I need to come back. I need to pick up about 45.4 and I need to run another half of an optimal charge weight work up and I need to go a couple of grains beyond 46. Again, looking very carefully for any pressure signs to see if that node continues and if 46 grains maybe would be a good accuracy node for me. 
I hope that gives you a little bit of idea on what to look for and how to go about doing your own load workup. There really is no right or wrong on this. It is a lot of trying to see patterns in what you're looking at and trying to discern what is gonna work best for your intended situation. Above all else, safety is paramount. You have got to be safe when you're doing this. Do not push the limits unless you know exactly what you're looking for. Eye protection is absolutely mandatory. All it takes is a really tiny screw up when you're doing load development to have a high pressure gas situation coming out of the side of that rifle and mess up your sight permanently. So please make sure you are wearing safety gear when you're doing this. Eye protection and ear protection at a minimum. That's all we have for this week's Mail Call Mondays. If you've got any questions or concerns on our load workup, please leave them in the comment section below or send them to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you've liked the episode, make sure you give us a thumbs up and please share and subscribe. Until next week, get out and shoot! Crap, got something in my eye here. Wow. Okay. Let's try that again. <laughs>